So, all right, well, welcome everyone to the to today's summer skills session. Um, as always, if you have any questions, shoot an email to tea at nd.edu, and we're happy to uh, help you out with whatever you need. Um, looking ahead, we're going to have uh, on July 11th at 4 p.m. Eastern a networking night with uh, or an industry social. Sorry, we're rebranding that because it's in the afternoon now. But we'll have uh, your fellow students as well as industry professionals there, so it'll be a great chance to uh, meet each other and meet some of our past presenters in a more uh, informal Zoom breakout room um, and a chance to you know, build some connections that'll hopefully last beyond you know, this summer. With that, um, oh, and with, sorry, I meant to say in the chat, I've posted the link to fill out the form, for the interest form to be on the email list for the net networking night. So go ahead and fill that out if you haven't yet. Um, so we just have an idea of like who is coming and how many will be there. With that, we'll go ahead and I'll introduce Paul. So Paul has presented actually once for us before, did an incredible job. Um, if you didn't see that, go back to the YouTube uh, channel and check out his presentation on um, career building. Um, but today he's gonna be sharing with us how to make a pitch um, and how to you know, sort of sell these great ideas that we come up with um, and best practices for communicating those ideas to the rest of the world. With that, I'll pass it off to you, Paul. Uh, you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Jake. Um, first of all, let me tell everybody that uh, it's a really a pleasure to be able to talk to you and speak to you. Actually, I'm speaking to you from the future because I'm 12 hours ahead of the East Coast here in uh, Beijing, China. Um, so today, the last time I spoke to everybody, it was about basically pitching yourself. Um, how do you sell yourself? Today, we're going to talk about how do you sell a project? How do you get people excited about your ideas and and hopefully get them to say yes, because that's really what we want to do, right? We want to build projects we want to continue to develop. So with that, I'm going to now attempt to share my screen. <clears throat> and uh, can everybody see that? Great. Um, excuse me if for um, glancing to my uh, right every now and then, because I've got my notes on another uh, monitor, so it may look like I'm not looking at you, but I am looking at you. Um, so anyway, pitch perfect. How to prepare and give a winning speech. And really it's all about, it's a really two things. It's about preparation and it's about giving the pitch. And so we're gonna talk about both of those things today. Um, so to get started, first get a million dollars. And this is one of my favorite jokes that Steve Martin ever gave. And he gave it, it's like, it's like 40, 50 years ago. Um, he came out on stage and he says, I'm going to tell you how to be a millionaire and never pay taxes. And he says, first, get a million dollars. And he just kind of let that slide. And the reason I like this idea today is we're not going to talk about how do you get your great idea. You guys have already got a half your great idea. I'm going to tell you how to not pay taxes on it, right? How to pitch it. So let's assume going forward that you guys have already got a great idea. All right. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to sell it? Well, what is a pitch? What, is, what are we trying to do here? Let's define a pitch. So it's a meeting uh, to communicate, usually by storytelling. And I'm going to emphasize storytelling because that's what we're going to train you to do. You're going to do your pitch by telling a story. Um, so you have to, it's about the creative intent and you want to gain consensus. And the, the key to this is you want to ask to proceed. It's an ask. It's, it's I'm going to share something with you and then I'm going to ask you to do something. And so that's, the, that's really the, the most important part of this is, and if you, know, if, you, if you have such a brilliant idea, but you can't communicate it, they, they don't understand it, then you're not gonna go forward. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to be a clear communicator, how to get your ideas across, and how to get them to say, let's go forward. Let's, let's continue to do this. At the end of the day, it's a sales job, right? You're trying to sell something. You're trying to sell yourself. You're trying to sell your company. You're trying to sell your team. You're trying to sell your idea. And now I have to get caught up with my notes. Okay, here we go. All right, here we go. Pre-pitch prose prep. So the first thing we're gonna start with is we're gonna start with the written word. We're gonna start with what your idea is. You gotta put it down on, on paper because you gotta speak it, right? So do you have a story, Morning Glory? You've gotta write your narrative down. Um, think about writing 
bullet points. I don't write the whole story down. What I do is I write bullet points that, and the parts that I really want the audience to, to understand what it is, why it's important, what's the wow, how are you going to market it? I, I want to try and solve all those problems for them. Okay. Remember the idea so far has only been in your head or maybe you're working in a team. It's only in your team's head. And so only you have imagined it at this point. So now you've got to get all this cool stuff in your head out. And how are you going to get all this out that it makes sense for the audience? Because you've, you may have lived with this idea for months or for weeks or, and you've, you've turned it all the way around and you've turned it backwards and forwards and you understand this idea better than anybody else. But unless you can get it out there, no one's going to really understand what you're talking about. All right. So what you want to do is you want to keep your words specific, bite-sized, action-oriented. Remember, the audience is going to be listening for the wow. How are they going to be able to sell this? How are they going to be able to make money off of this? Whether it's an, um, an attraction idea or a hotel idea or a, a new kind of restaurant or museum or whatever it is, they're trying to figure out how they're going to take your idea and sell it. Okay. One of the things that I, I see that um, lots of people who present don't really understand is think about the cause and effect. Um, if I tell you, so we get into this roller coaster vehicle and then it lurches to the left. Why? Why did it lurch to the left? Why did the, why does the, re, why, why does the ride vehicle go up? So think about cause and effect. Make sure that you have explained those things as you do the pitch because actions without cause and effect are just noise. They don't mean anything. All right. So figure out your story and think about cause and effect. If you're specifically, if you're talking about an attraction, you want to think about cause and effect. Don't say, well, it could be that it could be this. I want you to have an opinion. Okay. I want you to tell me what your idea is. Don't go into a pitch saying you really don't know. We're, we're going to have, if, if, if I like the idea, we're going to have these discussions until the, until the idea is done of choices, but I want you to come into the initial pitch with your opinion. All right. If I don't, if, if you give me a pitch and I like the idea, but I don't like, like the middle or some of these scenes don't work, we'll, we'll have those discussions, but I want you as the pitcher to have an opinion about what your idea is. All right. And Again, a great idea is not enough all the time. You've got to have wow. You've got to really think about it. Put your marketing hat on and you've got to think about how are they, how is my audience, how are they going to sell this idea? And so um, you've got to think about how the, how to sell that idea. Um, a cautionary, a tale from somebody that's been through this before. If you come up with a catchy title, you better love it because oftentimes those catchy titles will stick till the end. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that later. Um, but you, you want to have a catchy title. You want to have your, your story, your idea, your whatever you're trying to pitch should have something that causes an interest. Like, oh, that's interesting. What, tell me more about that idea. All right. So that's the prose part. Now let's talk about the picture part. Pre-pitch, picks, prep. Because going into a pitch, by the way, you don't, al you don't always need to have a supporting artwork. Sometimes your idea can just be communicated by words. I've often done that. We just go in and we say, here's the idea. And they say, great, go forward. Or they may say, I don't really understand it. Can you show me some pictures or something? And then we go back and do pictures. But if you're going to add pictures to your presentation, here's some thoughts about that. Um, you can do as few illustrations as possible just to get early buy in. You don't have to do 10 pieces of artwork to, to, share an idea or to communicate an idea. Just do what you need to do to get the idea across, okay? Now, should your artwork be vague or specific? And I, th this came from Herb Ryman, who was one of the Imagineering's greatest co um, concept artists. He had a thing called sp specifically vague or vaguely specific, in that your artwork wants to have enough information so that the, the viewer can say, oh, I kind of get it, but there's not enough information where all of the details are, are filled in. That way, whoever's looking at the piece of art can say, oh, I can imagine it. And then they start to get ownership of it. 
they start to imagine what this idea is in their own head. And now they're like, oh yeah, I, I can see this. So again, let the person you're presenting to join you in imagining the idea, leaving room for imagining it. It's kind of like the way um, impressionist artists used to work. They would give you enough information where you go like, oh, it's water lilies, it's this and that, but you as the viewer have to fill in the details, okay? So you, what you wanna do is you wanna tease them into wanting more. Um, you don't wanna over deliver on artwork early on because you want them to say, oh, show me more, which gives you the reason to continue working and to come back again. And finally, you don't have to do artwork. Um, the, the current job I'm in now, we have lots of ideas coming in. And the first step is we don't, we don't want artwork. We want reference images. We want emotional placemaking or emotional images to say what the idea is kind of about. So it's not specifically this or that, it's about emotion. So you don't need to have original art. And let me give you some, some examples here. Here's um, some concept art for Epcot Center. So vaguely specific or specifically vague. If you look at the bottom image, that is the Mexico Pavilion. And if you look at that piece of art, you go like, wow, there's not a lot of detail there. But there is, if you look at it, you go, well, there's a mariachi guy up on the balcony. There's a, a temple down at the bottom. It looks like there's a plaza of some kind. Are they, are they eating? Are they shopping? What are they doing? You don't know, but you don't have to know. All you have to know is, wow, this is a place I want to go. Especially if I told you, yeah, this is all indoors. You go like, wow, that's, that's cool. The picture up at the top, you know, the, the spaceship Earth. And you go like, wow, that's such an aspirational image. The, the sun is coming through the clouds and it's a, a happy future. And you go like, wow, I want to go there. But there, it's, it's void of most of the details. I mean, you see a, there's a monorail, there's spaceship Earth, there's people of all different ethnic necessities. Okay, I want to go there. So again, you don't need to have a lot of specific artwork to sell an idea. Keep it vague. Let the, uh, let the audience kind of fill it in a little bit. Here's an example of a, of a pitch I gave um, 15, 20 years ago. We didn't have money for artwork. And what they did, they came in and they said, we have a building, we want to do some kind of indoor special effects show. So we just grabbed images and said, here's the, here's the audience journey. Um, we go through and we go through this cave and then we go through this temple and we, but we didn't focus on the cave or the temple. We just gave them images to say, it could be well, like this. And that was enough to get their interest to say, yes, this sounds cool, please develop it some more. So an, a, a note here is that um, don't, if you're giving a pitch, don't focus necessarily on the placemaking unless it's important to your story. A lot of times when you focus on, on placemaking, you kind of put the, the audience experience aside because you're so interested in the placemaking that the audience kind of goes like, well, yeah, but that's not really what this should be about. It should be about the experience. So if the placemaking is important to your story, great, describe it. Um, but if it's not, just say, oh yeah, and then we enter this really cool cave and it's got these, all these lights around it and there's this waterfall coming and then move on. Keep, keep moving with your story, keep pitching your story. Um, sometimes one piece of key art is enough. Um, I had a, a client that said, they had, a, they had a zip line in, in Las Vegas and they said, can you make it look cool? And so thinking about the client, okay, the client, these are a bunch of casino guys. They like big splashy stuff. They, they're like what I would call est, est people, E-S-T, est. What's the big est? What's the fast est? What's the large est? So you'll, you'll run into these people a lot. Um, they're looking for the est, which is kind of counterintuitive to what we want to do. We want to create something that has an, a, an emotional story to it. But, you know, some people are est people. So we did one piece of art. We photoshopped um, a, um, a slot machine. And now, of course, be careful what you wish for because they built it. <laughs> so, um, and then this goes back to the story of be careful what name you give things because in, in jest, we called this thing Slotzilla because the world's largest slot machine. And now they call it Slotzilla in all the marketing. So be careful. But we, we pitched this idea with one piece of art and they bought it. And it was just a, you know, probably a one day Photoshop job of let's do a big slot machine. And so um, you don't need a lot of art. You just need something that's emotional that connects with the client okay all right tune your radio to WIFM 
What does WIFM? WIFM is what every single person that you ever pitch to will be listening to. And it stands for what's in it for me. Radio WIFM. And I'm going to have to catch up now to my slides here. Okay. So what's in it for me? You want to understand what the client's needs are. Um, so WIFM. And by the way, see this person, she built a radio inside of a coconut. And I don't know why, but the marketing folks want to call it iNut. So there you go. So here we go. What's in it for me? What does this mean? Universal, Disney, SeaWorld, Six Flags, anybody that you think you're going to pitch to, they all have different positioning, different branding. So understand what they're looking for. Disney is probably not looking for the next uh, seven inversion roller coaster. Okay, maybe they are, maybe they're probably not. Six Flags, however, might be. Um, Universal may be looking for the next media-based attraction. Um, Disney may be looking for the next family-based attraction. So try to understand who you're pitching to, what their needs are. Put yourself in their shoes. And then you have to guide your pitch to be able to hit, you want to hit their buttons. You want to be able to say words or give them things that, oh, this, you're, as the pitcher, understands my needs. All right? Do you understand their brand? Universal, Disney, Six Flags, they all have different brands. Um, Universal wants to go more teen oriented, a little bit more higher energy. Disney's more family oriented. Uh, Six Flags is Thrill Park. SeaWorld more about um, the environment and all of that. So think about who, what their brand is because you want to direct your pitch. Uh, if you're going to work in the museum world, one science museum is going to be different than another science museum. Or um, if you're developing a new hotel idea, Hilton is a different brand than Sheraton. And so start to understand who they are as a company. Okay, understand what is going to excite them. What's going to, to, to turn them on and what's gonna start the juices flowing like, oh yeah, I can see this idea. I think we can, we can really work with this. So start thinking about that. All right, here's a big one, PowerPoint or other delivery. So. PowerPoint has become the coin of realm in our industry. No one can, or um, we're going to say PowerPoint, but keynote, you know, same idea. Um, don't, don't rely on PowerPoint. Try and do your pitch without PowerPoint first, just to make sure that you're not relying on artwork. You're not relying on fancy graphics. You want to, you want, if you're going to use PowerPoint, you want it to be a background thing. You, but you as the pitcher, you want to be the story, right? You're the pitch. So make sure that if you're going to use PowerPoint, um, use it in a, in a creative way. What I did several times that was pretty successful is because I'm the only one that knows what the next slides are, I would use that to my advantage. Uh, for instance, when I did um, pitch Rock and Roller Coaster, we did storyboards that took the guests from the entrance all the way through the ride. And in several areas, we would have a, a, an image of people sitting in a roller coaster. And we'd say, and at this point, um, the, the, the cord is hit, the audio hits, and the ride will go, now start the ride. And then I would click the next slide, and I had the pictures of the people's face. And the next picture, their faces were back in their seats, like smashed. And it was a joke and it was funny and people go like, oh, that's so clever. But they got the point was um, that you're gonna go from zero to 60 in two seconds. So if you're gonna use PowerPoint, um, make sure you, you kind of use it to your advantage. Um, PowerPoint has another advantage in that the audience will wanna get to the end. You're, the people you're delivering the idea to will wanna get to the end. So if, you know, the old days before PowerPoint, we used to have big storyboards up that we would have to hide the, the sequential storyboards because people want to get to the end. So we would actually, we'd leave them out in the hallway. We'd cover them with pieces of the images with pieces of paper just to prevent um, the audience from trying to get ahead of you. Um, with PowerPoint, you're in control of that. You control the pace. So if you're going to use PowerPoint or Keynote, that's, that's a good thing. A lot of times you're going to come into a conference room and you're just going to have two or three pieces of art. And you're going to lay them down on the table. 
So that, that's another delivery system. So think about how you're gonna deliver your ideas and then if you're gonna do it that way or you're gonna bring a portfolio of art in or you're not gonna use any art, just think about your, how you're gonna deliver your idea. And swap the naysayers down with swap. Um, sometimes you're gonna be in a presentation room and there's gonna be no audience. And what I mean by no audience is there's gonna be people, people in there, their, their job is to say no. Strategic planning, um, um, finance people, project management, operators, they all are adverse to change. Change that makes them nervous. But you're coming in and you're saying, I want to come in and change something. So automatically they're on the defensive. Um, they're going to try and they're going to find reasons to say, ah, it's not, we're not, no, no, no. So we're going to talk about SWOT, S-W-O-T. What we're going to do is we're going to be a, we're going to do a preemptive strike. We're going to try and figure out who's going to say no. And we're going to try and figure out how to answer their no questions. All right. So if you've never done a SWOT analysis before, I'm going to take you through basically how to do a SWOT analysis. And you should, by the way, even if you don't do a presentation, you should always be doing SWOT analysis with your ideas. Okay, so here's how to do a SWOT analysis. Start by getting a piece of paper or a whiteboard and making a big cross on it, just like that. Then you're gonna write in the top left strengths and top right, you're gonna write weaknesses. Now, the strengths and weaknesses are for your idea currently as it is, all right? Then in the bottom, so you're going to write the strengths of how, how your idea has a competitive edge. Whatever the strengths are, whatever the weaknesses are in your, project, in your idea, there, there's going to be weaknesses. You're going to know what they are, right? And then the lower half, you're going to write the future consequences because of your idea. You're going to write what are the opportunities if you take my idea, and you're going to write what are the threats for my idea, all right? So what future developments and opportunities, can, what are the future developments? What are the trends or developments that could be that could derail your idea. Now here's some, here's some example things that you would write down um, for strengths. Uh, we can have this open for next summer. It's a great marketing time. There's a movie coming out. It has big THRC and we're gonna use the same building. We're gonna use the same ride system. Um, we can be, this, is, this idea is so cool. We're gonna be the, everybody's gonna wanna do this, but we're gonna be the first. These are typical strengths for your idea. Okay, some weaknesses. Uh, it's gonna be pretty expensive to do. Um, it's, it's based on an old IP. It's based on Song of the South, for instance. Um, it has a small THRC. Um, so, and, and also we're gonna need to build a new building and there's really not any big wows. So we're gonna look at all those, we're gonna list out those weaknesses. Opportunities, now again, the opportunities and threats are forward thinking. If, if we do this idea, what are the opportunities going forward? What are the threats going forward? Opportunities, we're gonna be more competitive in this market. Um, we can go to new geographical places. We, we're going to build a cruise line. So now we can take our brand everywhere, for instance. Uh, there's lots of merchandising spinoffs if we do this idea. So think about opportunities. And then finally, what are the threats? If we do this idea, what, you know, well, we think the competitors working on a similar project and they have a head start. So if we move forward, we might not be the first to have this idea open. And there's a heavy R&D development phase cycle. So it's possible we may miss the schedule. So Take your idea and create a SWOT analysis because what you're doing is you're, cre you're starting to look at your weaknesses and your threats. And now you're going to start, what are the ideas to combat these? How, because a no person in the meeting is going to bring these things up. Ah, it's based on an old IP. Well, yeah, it's based on an old IP, but it's based on an evergreen IP. It's based on an IP that, it's based on Wizard of Oz. Yes, it's old, but every year people think about Wizard of Oz as an example. So start thinking about how you're going to answer these questions in the threats and the weaknesses because someone will probably bring them up. And now I'm going to get caught up again in my notes. Sorry, folks. So the idea is that you wanna be proactive. Now, um, I know a lot of you are working on um, summer projects. You you're, you're got together and you're doing all these summer. This is great. I love this idea. Let me add something if you haven't done this yet. Somebody pretend to be the client and somebody creates uh, an obstacle or something that says, you have to have this open in two years, or you have to use an existing asset, or we don't have a lot of money, or whatever the, 
whatever the, the, the obstacle is, that will help you be, do this in a kind of a real world way. So that whoever is the owner or the client gives you this obstacle. Now, when you do your SWOT analysis, you know this obstacle is in there. So how are you going to combat this? Or how are you going to overcome this obstacle, right? So that's important for you to do is, just, is to not design things in this kind of idyllic bubble and just come up with an idea, but have some kind of obstacle be put in your way. And I think that will help you kind of define what you're doing and help you define your, your project. All right. Oh, it's showtime. We've got all this prep done. We've got our narrative. We've done our artwork. We've figured out how to tell this story. And now we have to go into the pitch, right? All right. So let me get caught up again. Sorry, folks. All right. Every pitch requires a bit of show business. Um, your audience, it, the people you're pitching to is your audience and everybody in, in an audience wants an experience. So you've got to create kind of a show business kind of atmosphere. Um, so feel like you want to get them engaged. You want to get them to get, feel like there's ownership to it. You don't want them to be a passive audience where they're just sitting back taking this in. It wants to be a dialogue. Your pitch wants to be interactive. It wants to be a dialogue. It wants to be a loop of information to the to whoever's getting the pitch and you want them to communicate back to you, right? You want this dialogue. Your pitch will go so much better if they're engaged. If they're just sitting back listening, you're going to get them looking at their watch. They're going to be drumming their, like this. They're going to be looking at their phone. If you're engaging them, if, you, if they're part of this experience, they don't, they don't get to do that because you're not going to let them. You're going to control the pacing and the pitch. All right. That's what you want to do. So again, if you don't, if you don't have their, um, their attention at the beginning, you'll never have it at the end. It just doesn't happen that way. All right. So here we go. We want to, we want to get them to be part of this. All right. So here's 12 ideas or ideas or, or tips to, to control the attention, to control the meeting. Start with a hook, uh, arouse your listen, listener's curiosity. I like to think of it like a, a, think of it as a teaser trailer. I never start the pitch with, here's an idea. I usually start the pitch with, imagine if I could take you to um, the land of Avatar and you could actually live in Avatar. I, what if I could take you to Pandora? I haven't told you what my idea is yet. All I did was I, I incited an idea in your head. What if I could do that? What if I could take you to the most icely cantina? What if I could, in your museum, what if I could create a way that you understand human development? Again, I haven't told you my idea. I'm just now getting you aroused. I'm getting you like, well, tell me more. So I want to start that. I want to start with, I want to start with posing a question. Again, when I pose a question, the listener now has to be, the listener has to be engaged because you've asked them a question. So they can't just ignore it. So, so you're, you're, you're driving their curiosity. Oh, well, tell me more. So that's where I want to start. From the very first sentence, the listener must want to know what happens next. So what if I could take you to Pandora and you could, you could experience everything in Pandora? They're like, okay, tell me more. What's next? Now you've got them, you've got the hook kind of set. And now you're set up for your pitch. Um, what if I could take you on this new ride that tells a story in a unique way that tells you the origins of Superman? All right, how are you going to do that? Yep, I got the hook set. Now we're ready to go. Now we're ready to go into the pitch. All right. Stay on target. Never introduce parts of your story that don't resolve or don't push the story forward. I hear lots of pitches, especially in my, even in my own team, a lot of where they go into details that don't matter to the story. They go like, well, then we're in this temple and in this temple, there's these gongs. And it's like, well, why is that important? That, that we don't go back to why there's a gong. There's no reason 
the gong doesn't, it's not magical, it doesn't mean anything, but they get so involved with the placemaking and telling me this setting that they've neglected to move me forward with the story. Don't introduce characters in your pitch that don't have a meaning or don't get resolved. Like, okay, but you told me about this curator person, then they, they never came back. What, why, did you tell, why did you tell me all this stuff and it never got resolved? And so make sure that when you're writing your narrative, that if you're gonna talk about something that's important, make sure it has a resolution. Make sure it, there's, a, there's a loop somehow that brings it all back together. Emphasize wow and funny. You gotta make your pitch entertaining. So many times you'll sit in a pitch and you'll go like, oh man, when is this gonna be over? But if you make it fun and, and, and make sure you emphasize the wows, it makes it more fun. Kevin Rafferty, uh, legendary Imagineer, writer, he would write songs and he would go into a pitch and he would start singing a song about the, about the, 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 the attraction or the idea. And everybody loved it. Just like, you're so engaged because this guy wrote a song about it and he's singing it. And now we're being, as an audience, we're being entertained, right? We're not, again, don't think of your audiences. They've come, they want to be entertained. So let's entertain them, right? So think about the wow, think about funny. And look, if it's not in your personality to be funny, think of other ways to make it entertaining, all right? And I encourage you to try and to work on being an effective pitcher is to, to have a little bit of humor, make it, a little bit, make it a little bit funny. Focus on, again, this goes back to focus on what's going on and what's exciting, not what it literally is. Don't, if, you're, if your attraction takes you through um, Snow White's Grotto, don't spend all the time talking about Snow White's Grotto. Talk about what's mysterious and it's, this weird music is playing and at any moment the wicked witch could come the witch could come with the apple and and then the dwarves come out and it's not about well all these jewels are in the wall and they're glowing yeah okay yeah we get that but what is going on what is exciting about being in this place not what it literally is so think think about as you craft your story as you craft your pitch you really want to keep the story moving forward um, as efficiently as you can i like to think like a film director um, remember, this idea has only existed in your head. So how are we going to get the audience to understand what you're talking about? So if you think like, think like a film director, a, a, a film director starts with an establishing shot, like paints the picture, we're on this uh, desert plateau, it's in the middle of Utah, and then we go to the medium shot, oh, we see a cowboy, and he's just standing on this cliff, and then we go to a close-up, and he's got his hand on the gun. So we've gone establishing medium close up. And now we've got this painted this picture. Use, instead of going in and you start the way, um, yeah, we, we go into this room and we see a guy with a gun. Okay, what room? What, who, what guy? Why does he have a gun? So start thinking about establishing medium and close up. And then once you understand that rule, and of course you can break it a little bit, you can mix it up a little bit. But if you start that rule first, then you start to think, okay, I've set the stage, I've set the, I've set the audience up to what's gonna happen. And then I think you'll, you'll find that your, tell, your storytelling will be a little bit clearer. And you wanna control the pacing. You wanna change the pacing, by the way. You wanna go fast, you wanna slow down where it's important. Um, but like, like in, a, in, a, in a movie that has car chases that goes fast and, you, and then it's a part where there's a love story, it goes slow. So you wanna change the pacing, that will keep the audience better engaged. So it's not one continuous pace, change it up. Employ the element of surprise. Again, I gave the example of the, the roller coaster where we had a picture of people there and the next picture their faces were smashed against the, the, the back seat of the roller coaster. It was a surprise moment. And then I, then I would go to the next slide and it would be a slide of the plan view of the coaster. And I would point, so we're here now, and then in 2.3 seconds, I would point at the other end of the room where the coaster is. And then I would go to the next slide and I would say, and in 2.3 seconds, now you're 70 feet upside down. You're 70 feet in the air and you're upside down. And then I would pause. And then I would say, and at this point, you realized you should not have had that extra hot dog at Mickey's. And, and, and people would laugh because they understand. Oh my God, 
in three, less than three seconds, I went from zero to 70 feet upside, there, upside down in the air. And we're, we've all had that moment like, oh crap, I think I'm gonna hurl. So I, I would use that as a moment of fun and surprise. And, and now people were like having fun. We're all having fun, right? We're trying to sell fun here. So let's have fun selling it. And so that, those kinds of things that I would, I would add in, I always, I always like the element of surprise. And when I build any presentation, I always put in two or three moments of gotchas in the presentation, something that they didn't know was coming that is a fun joke or a, a moment where they go, oh, great. And, and so now they start to understand it's really about fun. So get your audience to step into your guest shoes and I want you to walk with them. Here's a, a, another trick that I, I try and do. I imagine my audience is blindfolded and I'm gonna walk them through this attraction. We're gonna walk through it, but they're blindfolded because I've got to describe everything to them because again, this only exists in your head. So you've got to like, and so now we're gonna go into this temple and it's the temple from uh, the Tong dynasty. So you can imagine the colors of bright colors and it's, it's, even though it's present day, this temple has been perfectly preserved. And now I'm starting to describe it, but I'm not going through a lot of detail. I didn't tell them that there's statuary or there's scrolls and it's, they, they can fill that in. They can fill those moments in with their head. You just want to set the, set the place. And now we've, we're met by this old monk. This old monk approaches us and tells us the story of the seven immortals. And he tells us that we're going to go on the journey of the seven immortals. And again, if you remember the audience can't see, so you have to describe these things. And, and hopefully you have a little bit of art that, that describes it. If not, you have a, a, an emotional piece of art that kind of gives them a sense of what a Tong dynasty uh, temple looks like. And again, we're not gonna go into details. I wanna keep moving the story forward. If, you're, if, if there's an action in your story or in, if there's an action in your pitch, relate it back to the story. Um, you, uh, m many of you have maybe have written a, a trick track coaster where, you know, normal roller coaster goes down the track and you have, you know, go up hills, down hills. Now with trick track, sometimes the vehicle actually drops or the vehicle goes sideways. If there's an action to your ride system related to the story, like, and then the roller coaster vehicle drops 20 feet. Okay. Why? Why did it do that? Okay. So now we're on a ride vehicle and we turn to the left. Okay, why are we turning to the left? It's like, think about if there's an action to your pitch, relate it back to why it does that, cause and effect. Be aware, your body is talking before your tongue moves. When you go enter a room to pitch or you're in the room and somebody enters, your posture, your energy is the first thing they're gonna notice before you say one word. So, you know, have some high energy, look professional, be engaging, um, shake their hand, introduce yourself. All of those things will matter for them to listen to you. If you, if, if they enter the room and you're like, not interested, they're not going to be interested in your pitch. So you are, you want to bring the enthusiasm. You got to bring the enthusiasm to the party. It's your party. You've invited these people. So now you have to bring the enthusiasm to it and you have to make them feel welcome. So make sure that you do that. Have conviction. Um, when you pitch something, I wanna, I wanna hear in your voice that you believe this is the best idea out there, right? I'm gonna see maybe five, 10 ideas in a day. I want your idea, I want you to believe your idea is the best until so you have to believe it. If you don't believe it, I'm not gonna believe it, right? So you have to say, this is the best idea and, and you've already done your SWOT analysis so you already know why it's the best idea. So be sure to, to tell me, this is a great idea because it's got a great IP. We can use the existing ride system. We can have it open by next summer. Tell me why your idea is the best. So have conviction, all right? Be ready and willing to drop your script when the situation calls for it. And it will always call for it. I've never, not once been in a pitch in my 40 plus years that has gone the way I thought it was going to go. Somebody will bring something up. Somebody will ask a question. I don't want to say they get sidetracked, but there will be something that will happen in your pitch that you didn't anticipate. So be prepared to set your, um, your script aside. You've, you've pre prepared these 20 slides 
and you're ready to go, but be prepared to throw it out if, if, it, if they're not listening or if they're not responding. You have, to, you have to be ready to pivot. You have to be ready to change the way you do things, okay? So, um, so you, have to, you have to make sure that you're holding their attention. Sometimes as designers, we fall in love with objects and we fall in love with architecture and we wanna describe those things. But remember, they, they are looking for the story. They're looking for the experience. So make sure that we don't, we don't fall in love with describing objects and places and all that there. Make, make sure we, we're really focusing on the guest experience in your pitch. Um, make your pitch conversational. Um, again, you, you don't want to have an audience just back there not doing anything, just but listening, but make, make them part of it. Remember, all story is emotion-based. Story is about emotion. You want to get their emotion. If your audience is not feeling it, they're not listening. So you want them to feel it, okay? Um, so with that, what are the things that can cause a problem? Um, what are the things that you have to be prepared for? And this is di driven to distraction. You have to read the audience. Don't jump into pitch mode and not pay attention to the audience. Are they fidgeting? Are they looking at their watch? Are they checking their phone? Are they, if they're doing any of those things, you've, you're, you're losing them or you've lost them. So now you have to re-engage them. Stop your pitch. Stop. Say, all right, um, so far, have, have I said anything that's not clear to you? Do something that re-engages them. Um, take a drink of water. You, you want to make sure that you re-engage the audience before they're completely like, okay, well, I've, I've got to go. Um, you, so whatever they're doing, you want to read the audience, make sure that they're still engaged. All right. Beware of pregnant pauses. You hopefully don't have a, an, a time when the PowerPoint screws up or your computer runs out of battery or something happens. You, you want to avoid the pregnant pauses. You want to control the moment that the pitch starts till the moment the pitch ends. You want to control that moment of time. So pregnant pauses are really bad because then people start looking around like, what's next? So try and avoid pregnant pauses if you can. Don't let the energy leave the room. Remember, your, it's your party. You've got to be up the whole time. You've got to be like, man, I, I just can't wait to show you this idea. We've really worked hard. We think we've really cracked the nut on this. This is one of the, you're going to, this is one of the best ideas. I hope you're going to see today. We're really excited about it. And we hope you're as excited as we are. So keep that energy up. Finally, do not for the love of God, read PowerPoint slides without adding context. I have seen so many presentations where a slide will go up and all they do is read the words on the slide. That tells me two things. One, you don't know your own presentation and two you don't believe your own presentation right you you have to you cannot just sit there you might as well have mailed me the the powerpoint if that if you're just going to read it why are you here save your breath you could have just sent it to me so yes you can you can read bullet points on a slide that's fine but add something to it add context you'll notice that during this presentation today I put a lot of words up, more words than I typically like on PowerPoint. On PowerPoint slides, I usually like less than eight or nine words, but you know, we have a lot of information. But I didn't just read the words. I've added context to those bullet points. So don't, don't just read words on a slide, okay? You, I want you to be so well rehearsed, you don't even need to look at the slides. You know what's coming up. You know what the next slide is. You know, um, what the information is. Oftentimes, I'll just look at a slide and I'll remember what, I, what the point was, why I put that slide in, and I don't, re I don't look back at it. I want, I, want the, I want the audience to look at the slide, oh, that's cool, and then look at me, because I'm the one that's telling the story, not the PowerPoint. Remember that, you're the storyteller, not the PowerPoint, not the presentation on the slide, okay? Finally, now we gotta close the deal. We've done all this work. Now we want to close the deal. So what are we going to do? You're not done until they say, I got it. You, you might want to stop. When you're done with the pitch, you go like, Did, is there anything you didn't get, understand? If they go like, no, no, I got it. Great. If they go like, well, I didn't understand that part in the middle. Go back to the part in the middle. 
Let's, let's go through it. Let me explain to you. And then if they point, if they're, if they're able to poke a hole in something, go, ah, yeah, you're right. We're going to have to work on that. All right. Good point. And by the way, they, they, more than likely they will find something that they'll poke a hole in. They have to like, you know, justify that they've paid attention. So they may do that. I like to end with a resolution that, that ignites some kind of action. So I like to, I like to stop when I'm at the end, go like, so this is our presentation. Um, we're really excited to take this to the next phase. And I, I tell them what it is. So what we'd like to do is we want to um, do a little bit of more artwork on the beginning, the queue. Um, we want to write that a little bit cleaner. Right now, it's, it seems a little long. And, and I don't think we need two queue holding areas. And so I start to think about how I want to have them be engaged and how they, I want them to have ownership. And I want to, I want to create actionable items for the next phase because I'm assuming they're going to say yes. I, I go into the pitch meeting saying, this is great. Where do I sign the check? I go in with that mindset. You should go in with that mindset. Don't go into a pitch meeting thinking like, gosh, I hope they like it. Go in with the mindset like they're going to love this idea. They're, they can't wait for the next phase of development on this because this is such a cool idea. So you've got to believe in it and you've got to believe that they're going to say yes. So I want to talk about next steps. I want to talk about what we're going to do next. And even if you don't get a hard yes, even if they say, well, we're going to have to take this back to the board. We're going to have to, uh, we're going to, have to think about this. We saw a lot of ideas today. Um, we're, we, you know, we'll take this in consideration. I want to talk to them. All right, well, what kind of things should we work on while you're making that decision? You may get a, well, just don't, don't do anything. And okay, that's fine. You live for another day. But sometimes they'll go like, well, um, could you really, the ending really kind of fell flat. You're like, okay, noted. We're going to work, we'll work on that ending. Next time we see you, we'll, it'll be bigger. Wow. So try and get them to say, try, try and get them not to say no. That's basically it. You want to turn a no into a yes. And if you go in thinking like, well, this is a, this is pretty good. Um, let's go forward. That's where we want to go. And finally, thank you. And, and good luck. Um, there is no, there's no such thing as a perfect pitch. Again, Every pitch I've done has gone a little bit like, I don't say sideways, but it's gone different than what I thought. But at the, at the same time, they've all been positive. Um, I, don't, I don't get 100% yes, but I think I've done pretty good. And if you go in with enthusiasm and if you believe your idea, it will help push it over the edge. Not every idea is going to get sold. That's okay. Um, never throw anything away, though, because you never know when an idea is going to come back. And now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yay. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. That was a stellar presentation. Uh, I enjoyed that very much personally. And I know looking back at some of my experiences, I'm like, wow, I really could have used some of these ideas to have done better in the past. So I'm very, very thankful that we have uh, this stuff. But we'll open it up to Q&A now. So if you have a question, feel free to either message it in the chat, raise a hand, or just unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask it. Go for it, Angel. Uh, hi, Paul. Great presentation. I wanted to see if you can uh, just uh, recap again or uh, say it in a different way uh, when you mentioned uh, closing the deal and, and active, um, what's going to call it, um, uh, ending it with an action, if you can explain more on that or show it a sure a different way. Yeah, yeah, sure. So again, it's about, it's about you know, like you think about a, a salesman, right? A salesman will a good salesman will never say, take a no. They will always try and find a way to turn a no into a, into a well, let's, let me explore it further. So if, if they say to me, if a, if a client says to me, um, not really sure it's right for us, then I'm going to go, okay, well, what part is not right for you? Um, well, it's not on our brand. Oh, well, you know, this story is, it's a universal story. So we can, we can understand your brand a little better and I can adapt it for you. Let me, let me take a chance. Let me take a stab at adapting it to your brand and get back to you. Or let me, um, if they say, uh, no, it looks really expensive. I, I don't think we, we don't have the budget for that. And I go like, well, you know what? We came in here with everything that in the, the kitchen sink and everything, because we really wanted to wow you give me a chance to take it back to the core elements, the core wow moments. And let me get back to you with a, something I think that you could probably afford a little bit better, but still maintaining all of the, the things that you liked about this. Or if they say, um, yeah, I didn't really care for the idea. 
They're like, well, okay, well, um, you know, well, tell me, did you like the idea of the adaptation of the ride system? Did you like the adaptation of using the existing facility? And I go like, well, yeah, of course we want to use the existing facility. Then I'll go like, great. Let me, let me see if we can adjust the story a little bit so it's more, more palatable to you. I always want to try and get, I want to try and get the next meeting. I, want, I, want, I don't want them to say, oh, well, well, we'll let you know. I want, I want to stay in control of it if I can and say, well, I'm going to let you know. It's like, we're going to, we're going to take the things that you were uncomfortable with. We'll, we'll craft it a little bit better so that you are comfortable with it. That's, that's basically what it comes down to is why try and understand why are they saying no? What's the, what's the, what's the impetus for the no? We don't have the budget. It's not right for us. I don't like the idea, whatever it is. I want to understand the why. And then I want to say, I can fix it. All right. So that's kind of how I, how I approach that. Got it. Understood. Thank you very much. Awesome. It looks like Caitlin, you have your hand raised next. I had a question on um, kind of presenting the story and how many words you mentioned on a PowerPoint. I know you said about eight to nine. I was wondering if you're presenting a story and walking people through it, do you think fewer words are always better or that there should be some guiding words on the presentation? I always, I always put guiding words on and I, I'm not sure where the under 10 words PowerPoint thing came. I th that may have come from like Steve Jobs or somebody. He, he famously mm -hmm. wrote you know, PowerPoint shouldn't have more than six words or something uh, per slide. And by the way, I don't agree with that because I think there's a lot of information that you can put on. The, the point here is that you don't want the audience to read the story on the screen. You want the story to come from you, right? So I, I typically will, a lot of times I don't even have words at all when I'm pitching. I just have images because I want that. I, I, I don't want them to read ahead because I don't want them to get to the, the, the conclusion to the story before I'm ready to tell it. I want to control the pacing. So actually most of the time I will have a slide with just an image and maybe it says on the bottom, it will say uphill or it'll say something that reminds me, oh yeah, the, the, the roller coaster is going uphill or the, 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 something, but it's just maybe a word or two, but I want them to, I want them to watch, look at me. Because I want to say, and then what happens here, you see the image here, what happens here is we've entered this temple and we're met by this old guard. And this old guard says, I have a story. To, and I'm, I'm the storyteller, right? And I'm right in your face. I'm going like, and this old guard comes up and he's got the staff and the staff's got the skull on it, you know, and he's, he's going to shake it in front of us. And, and we'll probably do this with a live character. And I, I kind of throw this in because I want, again, I, they, don't, they, they don't know this idea yet. And we'll probably do this with a live character. He'll come in and he'll shake the staff and say, I have a story to tell you. And at that moment, the lights come down and the music comes up. And now in their head, they're going like, and then what? And then what? And then what? <laughs> well, that's, that's, what I, that's what I want them to, to come to. And so, and then I'll go like, and then what? And then I, maybe I change the slide. And I go like, and then lightning strikes outside the window. And so I'm, I'm getting them to... Because now, now they can see it and they can like, ah, uh, I want to go to there, you know, and I want to, I want to experience this. And so that's kind of the way I do it. Now that, that this is my, my personality, right? My, my enthusiasm. So you have to find what's comfortable for you. It's like, I can't wear your clothes and feel comfortable. You can't wear my clothes and feel comfortable. You have to find your approach that makes it comfortable for you. But to answer your question, I typically don't have a lot of words. Again, this, the, this, the pitch today was wordy because I think there's a lot of information that maybe won't come across. I was afraid wouldn't come across, but I could have done this. I could have done this pitch without any slides today. I would have my notes and I would have, Oh yes, I, I'll make sure we talk about that. But so I just try and I try and I guess come down to make sure that you become the storyteller, not, not the, not the PowerPoint. Got it. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So we have, Alec had his hand raised first, and then we'll jump into the questions from the chat after that. Hello. Uh, thank you so much. This is fantastic. I have a question about kind of after, after you give the book something to get them interested, what do you think of a brief story overview, kind of a few sentences just explaining the story, or do you more kind of walk them through the story as the whole presentation goes? Like, do you think it's giving it away if you 
give a four sentence summary of the, the story or should you kind of drag it along through the presentation? Good question. I want, I want the element of surprise to still be there. But I, I do want to I do want to set them up to what the what's going to happen. So there's a probably a preamble of I have an idea that takes the um, uh, that takes uh, Splash Mountain and re re um, positions it to modern day audiences. So at least they now they get a sense of okay what what are we talk talking about? So I, I try and set them up that way a little bit, and then I go then I I, I tell them the story and and. But I don't, I don't give an overview of the story to start with. Um, I just think, I think it's better storytelling to keep them interested in not knowing what happens next. And I don't want to, I don't want to give them the ending, especially if the ending is a surprise. I want them to, I want them to be, um, uh, what's next? What's next? What's next? And so if I, you know, if you give it away early, then you're, you're not going to get that kind of connection. And so I, I tend not to tell them what happens, but I, I do set up like, you know, the establishing shot, the medium shot, the close up. I do tend to give the establishing shot of the pitch early on. Today, we're going to talk about uh, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And um, we have an idea that we think will, we can remarket Big Thunder and get a whole new audience that will come to Big Thunder. Done. And now then I go into the pitch and I don't tell them how or what until I'm ready to expose that. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Yep. All right. So we have our question from the chat coming from Josiah. And he's asking, what are some tips and tricks to practice in your pitch? Do you record yourself, get friends to give feedback, work through flow of words, et cetera? Yeah, that's, that's a, great, a great question. Um, I run it through my head. And um, I, typically what I'll do is I will, I will write notes down. I have, I, I carry these cards with me. You see, it says, this is pitch, this, this, this is pitch information. I don't know if you can see it, doesn't matter. So I, I carry these notes around with me all the time. And I, whenever I get an idea, I write it down. Oh yeah, I wrote on this one, for instance, I wrote bite-sized pieces, pull out action words, um, find a subtle way how they can have ownership. And so, and then even like when I'm out, if I don't have my cards with me, if I'm like at a restaurant or somewhere, and I go like, oh, right, I, I have to tell them that. I have to, I have to mention this. I'll write myself an email. <laughs> I'll send myself an email saying, don't forget, to make, don't, don't forget to tell them we're reusing these animated figures or whatever it is. And so I write all these notes down and then I, I, I kind of put them in a, in a narrative way. This is before I even open up Keynote or PowerPoint. I just start thinking about it that way. And I run it through my head and I create an outline in my head of what I want to do. I want to like, do this and then I got talk with them. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, open up a PowerPoint. L uh, let me, let me, let me do this a way that maybe makes more sense to you. We're in a, we're in a, we're a group and we're, we're getting ready. We're creating a new idea. Right. And you know, Jacob is going to do the engineering and somebody's going to do some artwork and we're talking, we're brainstorming this idea and they go like, okay, Paul, you're going to pitch this idea. Right. And I go like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pitch it. And then, so I kind of put this outline and I go like, you know, this one concept here, about going to do this. I don't think that's really clear. Can we get a piece of artwork? And, and we go like, ah, oh, we don't have anybody to do artwork. And I go, oh, that's good. We'll, we'll find a piece of, we'll find a, a reference image. That's okay. And so I start to build the presentation that way. Um, rehearsing wise, I don't rehearse necessarily. I don't like sit there and give a speech because I don't, I don't do, I don't do rehearsed speeches. I just speak. Um, so it would, it would be, re there wasn't be nothing to rehearse because uh, I'm, if I did this presentation tomorrow, I would com say some things were completely different other than, you know, I, I know what I want to say. I would just say it in a different way. Um, so, but I do go through the PowerPoint a lot. When, once I build it, I go through it a lot and I go like, Oh yeah, I want to make sure I make sure I emphasize this point here. And then I'll go down to the notes section and I'll say, that's why I was referring to my notes over here. Cause I know what I want to say at what point, um, what's important. So I just remind myself what to say. So I, I just go through it a lot. And I'll, and I, sometimes I overthink it. Sometimes I go like, why am I changing the font? This, no one's going to care about the font. And so like, I, I, every time I go through it, I find something that I go, Oh, that I could, these slides need to be in a different order. Cause I, I, in my head, I think about how am I going to tell the story? How am I going to tell the story of how to do a pitch? And so I, I, I reorder things. And I, on this thing, I reordered it and I said, Oh, the SWOT analysis needs to be somewhere in the middle. Oh, right. I need to have the WIFM thing up closer because 
you really want to start thinking about how what your client needs are before you start putting the pitch together. So I move those slides around and I, I start doing that way. But I don't, I don't rehearse. Um, I, I run a lot. So I, and when I run, I think about presentations and I think about, oh, I, if I said those words in a different way, it'd be funnier, more funny, or it would be more impactful. And so that's the way I, that's kind of the way I do it. All right, that's great. So now from Tahera, building off of Josiah's question, how do you battle stage fright slash nerves, even if you are solid in your pitch and practiced? Um, I, the, the, I've, I psych myself out. Um, but by the way, I have, you know, I have a lot of years of experience, so it's kind of a little different for me. But for you, what I would suggest is put in your presentation a wow, funny thing or a, an unexpected thing. And so now in the back of your head, you're going like, wow, I can't wait to get to this slide because when they see this slide, they're going to crack up. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about being nervous. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, when I get to this picture of the cow on the car, you know, whatever it is you start to think about, you're starting to think ahead. And so I, the, the, the thing about nerves is, um, I, I read the other day about nerves and about being nervous and nervousness is just adrenaline. So you have all this adrenaline going into your body and that's what makes you feel nervous. So how do you, how do you take this, all this adrenaline and redirect it? How do you take this adrenaline and redirect it to enthusiasm, right? So there's no way to say, I can't tell you how to feel. I can't tell you how, no, don't be nervous. I can't tell you how to feel, but I can tell you that nervousness is just adrenaline in your body. So try and figure out a way to redirect it into enthusiasm. Like, and so one of the tricks that I used to use is, again, I would put in a joke or something in, in the presentation that I know it's coming and I know it kills every time. And I know it's gonna put me at ease when the audience is on my side I can relax, right? Because you go into it, why are you nervous? Well, you don't know if the audience, you, the audience is going to judge you. You think the audience is judging you. They're judging your idea because as artists, as designers, we ha tend to have a difficult time separating ourselves from our ideas. They, they, seem, they seem to be extension of us. And that's not true. You know, an idea is an idea and you are you, but because we're artists and we're sensitive and we're, you know, that way, we, we tend to think that, my artwork or my writing is me. And so we tend to think I'm, I'm going to be judged because my idea is going to be judged. So try and think about that's not really the truth. Um, and just again, take that nervousness and kind of try and redirect it into enthusiasm. Um, just be careful that you don't get over enthusiastic because then you, you come off as kind of fake. So you just have to, you know, and, and again, it comes with experience and comes with practice. If you get nervous, do the presentation in front of your friends, in front of your family. Um, try and do the presentation without PowerPoint. Just print your notes out and don't use PowerPoint. Just do it that way. And then you, you, can, be, you can become a little bit more um, at ease with the PowerPoint is just there as background, just a crutch. And so, um, I don't know, hopefully I answered your question. <laughs> right, that sounded great. So we'll move through a couple more here in the chat. This next one is sort of transitioning a little away, but how do you recommend asking for a pitch meeting? Is it appropriate to email and ask for a one-on-one -on -one, or is there a time of year or a specific person to look for? That's a difficult one because normally companies like Disney, Universal, SeaWorld, they won't take a pitch um, because there's, there's ownership issues, right? There's intellectual property. If you, go, if you go to one of these companies and pitch an idea and then they say, no, thanks. But two years later, you see your idea. You're going to go like, hey, you guys stole my idea. And so they're very worried about that, okay? So, so cold calling to do a pitch is really not something that happens a lot. Um, smaller companies, they may do it, but bigger companies won't. Really, the, the, the idea is here that once you get into the companies, then you, you have to pitch, then you'll learn how to pitch their style. Um, but to, to, to cold call somebody, it's, it's difficult you, because you want to protect your ideas too, right? You don't want somebody to take your ideas and go like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, we're not paying for it. We're going to do it. We're not going to pay you for it. That happens. That happens. And so you have to be careful that you don't want your idea to be stolen too. You have to want to make sure you protect your idea. So remember, whoever you're pitching to, you want to be, make sure they're trustworthy. 
Um, so, you know, you, you find out who's looking for ideas, um, you know, TEA events or whatever, you, you, or you go to Blue Loop or sometimes there's, you know, some submissions, but I, I rarely have seen open calls for ideas. Everybody's just worried about intellectual property theft. And so that doesn't really happen that much. But some of these tips are more like once you're in a company or once the company has hired you, then then you don't have to worry about cold calling for a pitch. They, they've already they've already contracted you to come up with ideas. So it's it's less about cold calling. All right. Thank you for that advice. We'll move in back sort of in the same direction we were earlier. But do you have any tips on body language and gestures? Is Lisa's yeah. Yeah, don't do what I'm doing, which is slouching forward. You, you want to you want to be proud, right? You, you're a, you're a, you're all good looking people, and you you have something interesting to say. So so you you can't wait to say it. So you know, s sit up straight. Whenever somebody enters the room, stand up, um, greet them, um, be personal, look them in the eyes. Don't don't keep looking down at your notes. Look them in the eyes. You want to be friendly, smile. Um, so you know just. You know, be, make sure that you make sure if you're going into professional situation, you dress professionally, not like somebody that wears T-shirts like me. You know, like so you want to you want to look nice. You you don't doesn't mean you have to wear a suit and tie, but you want to be professional. You're they're hiring you because you're a professional, so you want to you want to look professional, right? Um, you want to be you know you want to be washed. <laughs> you know you want to you don't you, you want to you're going into, remember, you're asking them to give you a bunch of money. I'm asking you to give me a bunch of money. So are you going to give a bunch of money to some guy that works, you know, torn as tennis shoes and a t-shirt? Probably not. Somebody that comes in a suit or at least a suit jacket with a button shirt, you have a better chance. So remember that you're, you're going in there asking for a bunch of money or a bunch of, or you're asking them to believe in you. So you want to like try and give that, that error. But anyway, just be, just be a, be a good person. Be, be upbeat. Um, try and be positive in your body position and the way you interact with people. Be positive. That puts them at ease, right? Then they're, now they're sudden, they're not all of a sudden they're like going like, wow, this guy's in a bad mood. Like, I can't wait to get out of this meeting, but you're po They want to be, people want to be around positive people. That's just natural. So if you're positive, Hey, I want to, Hey, you're a positive guy, Jacob. Let's hang out. What do you got? Tell me your idea. That's, that's kind of the way I approach it. Awesome. And so building off of that question, Jessica is wondering, how do you work with personal speech quirks such as stuttering? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the, I don't know the, the stuttering specifically. I'm not sure I understand enough the medical condition to say, their techniques to overcome it. Um, I'm sure there are, I, but I'm not qualified to tell you, well, what you should do is do this. Um, I, if, if, it's, if stuttering is something that you have or you think is an issue that you need to get addressed, I would go to a speech therapist. I would go to a doctor and say, hey, my job is to stand up in front of people and talk. And I have this condition where it's difficult for me to do. So what are some tools and tips and techniques I can work on because my job relies on me to talk to people. Um, so that's kind of what I would do. Um, I, I wish I could, I wish I was more knowledgeable about to give you a specific answer, but um, now I'm, I'm an introvert. So for me early in my career, it was very difficult for me to stand up in front of people because part of introversion is being shy and being, you know, self, there's self-confidence issue. I've learned to overcome it because I've gotten to a point where I have confidence in what I'm going to say is fun and engaging and people want to hear what I have to say. But it, it took a while, you know, it takes, it takes experience and it just takes practice. And, but I, I, if, if stuttering is something or if you have a speech impediment, I would encourage you to go to a professional and see if they can help you because be part of our job, part of your jobs is to sell ideas, to sell yourself. And so that's something I would probably go and get checked, um, but with a professional. Awesome. Uh, moving on, I think we'll have about two questions left before we finish up, but from Danielle, she's asking at what point do you talk about SWOT logistics? Does that occur after the storytelling? 
to the pitch or do you leave in logistics throughout? No, I, I do it. I do it before because the, the idea of doing a SWOT analysis is you, you want to combat. People are going to sit in the room and they're going to go like, yeah, but what about, you know, I don't like the idea because of this. You've already figured that out. You already know that question is going to come or that criticism is going to come. So you've already thought of the, the answer, right? So I, I, I do SWOT analysis almost all the time. When you first get an idea, like here's a, here's a blue sky idea. And I go, wow, that's a great idea. What are, what's, what's good about this? What are the problems with this? What are the opportunities? What are the weaknesses? And then I start to think, oh, okay. So now as I develop the idea, it's in the back of my head. I got to really think about these. It's a low THRC. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intimate experience that only 10 people can do at a time. That could be a problem in a theme park world. How are we going to combat this? You know, when you think about um, Ollivander's at, um, at Universal, the, the wand shop, that's a great experience, but it's, it's limiting. It's only so many people can go there. So one of the threats would be low THRC, high demand, low THRC. So if I was giving that pitch, I would go like, yeah, so we're going to build more than one. You think you're going into one, but you're going into different rooms. And so that's how we take this idea of this intimate experience, but we can service a lot of people. So you want to be proactive in the na getting rid of the naysayers, right? Because sometimes you're going to have no people in a room. You're going to have a finance guy going like, oh, we don't have the budget for this. But, but the creative guy's going like, yeah, but this is so cool. So you've got to like figure out how to address their prop, how, to, how you're going to address their problems. And you, the SWOT analysis puts you in front of it so you can start to think about how are we going to solve this? So that's, I do, I do SWOT analysis. The, the, the moment I can, there's enough of an idea, I start, to, I start to diagram it. And then you certainly want to do it before the pitch because the idea is that you want to preempt those kinds of questions. Or if, if it doesn't occur to them, I want to point out the strengths. And you know, we have a Marvel movie coming out next year based on Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and this would be perfect for that. And now they're starting to put their marketing hat on and go, like, yeah, I didn't think of that. And you go, like, yeah, I know you didn't think of that. That's why I, th I thought of it first. So now you, you start to, to tell them the strengths and you've already preempted the threats. Awesome. All right, we'll have this be our last question here from Chris. Uh, and he's asking, is it good to make comparisons to other projects when doing a pitch? Like if you said, this is Thunder Mountain meets Haunted Mansion or Indiana Jones in a fantasy setting. Uh, yeah, like referencing projects to get the people listening to the pitch to understand yeah. it more thoroughly. No, absolutely. absolutely. You, you want to give them a frame of reference. Um, you could say, this is Tower of Terror on steroids. You could say, you know, whatever it is, that gives them a frame of reference. But I would, then I would say, this is like Haunted Mansion meets uh, Big Thunder Mountain but in a new twist. I would, I would lead with, but in a new way or in a way that's never been done before. So now you've got them, oh, all right, tell me more. I mean, that's what you want, right? Tell me more. You want them on the edge of their seats. What? You just said this is like two of the best attractions Disney's ever done, but it's better? All right, prove it. So yeah, I, I always, if, if I can, I give frame of reference uh, because a lot of times these people, not these people, sometimes the people you're pitching to don't really understand the creative stuff and they can't see it. So if you can give them a frame of reference, um, then that, that gives you a little bit of a head start. But then you wanna make sure that you tell them, but it's different, but it's not the same thing again. Uh, you know, just make sure that you emphasize it's better or it's different or it's something. But it's, it's certainly okay to make, give frames of reference. Awesome. Are you guys able to hear me right now? I can. Hello. I can hear you. Some trouble with my Zoom here, if you guys can. You just froze up on the video, but we can hear you. There you go. All right, I think I'm having some trouble. Do you want me to do the sign off? <laughs> Hello? You probably can't. All right, well, for those of you who don't know me and Caitlin, I'm also helping out with the, the skill sessions with leading them. Um, so after wrapping up the, the Q&A, just to let you guys know, we do have a industry social this Saturday. If you guys would like to come, you're more than welcome. Sorry, welcome. It's at 4 p.m. EST on the same Zoom link. 
And I also want to let you guys know if you have any projects from previous sessions that you would like to submit, we put them on our wiki page. And there is a Google Drive link in the emails I sent out. So feel free to put any information up there. But that's about it. And thank you, Paul, for doing such an awesome session. I know I learned a ton from that. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me, and I, I really enjoyed it. I hope uh, somebody got, I hope you got something out of it. I know I did because it made me think about how I give pitches. And so just doing this exercise reminded me of some things that I may have forgotten about. So um, thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Oh, it looks like maybe Jake's back. <laughs> thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Zoom just booted me off randomly, of course, right at the end. But. <laughs> All right, well, everybody have yep. a great day. Congratulations on taking the initiative to create your own projects in the summertime, and it's really inspiring. And um, I wish you all the best of luck. I know we're all gonna get through this. Um, just gonna be, it's gonna be a little while longer, but um, I can tell you from China, it's getting better here every day. Um, so it, there, is a, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Awesome, well, thank awesome. you so much, Paul, for visiting us with us from across the globe. It's pretty cool. All right, take care. Yep. Have a good day, everyone. Good night. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you all so much. Have a good one, guys.